<laughs> no, I, <laughs> I apologize. Up. It's uh, I'm good. Commissioner Rothstein. It's March something, and I don't know what date it is. But it's Tuesday. I know that March 29th, uh, we will have session this morning and open session this afternoon. And then we'll follow on Thursday. We have mostly uh, agency hearings uh, for today, and uh, and we'll move right into Thursday. Um, as always, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, thank you. <clears throat> now I'll sit. Now you can sit. Ooh. You got rid of Frazier that quick? Okay, what we're going to start with is... Uh, he said he's done. Celine, I appreciate you coming on up. Approval to submit application accept the award for the FY23 Summer Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP, and authorize the allocation of the required county match. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm joined this morning uh, with Vicki Keller, the director of the Carroll County Department of Social Services, and also Karen Bernard, the Family Investment Assistant Director for DSS with Carroll County. Um, and I am here this morning. Um, we're seeking approval and authorization to submit application and accept the award for the FY23 Summer Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and authorize the allocation of the required uh, county match. The Maryland Department of Family Investment Administration administers the, SNAP, um, the Summer SNAP program, which was established to address food insecurity over the summer and the winter months when schools were on break, which would allow low-income children um, food access who would not otherwise have access to those meals. The state general fund allocation is $63,360 with the required local share of funding or county match of $28,512 for a total program budget of $91,872. The local share of funding for each ju jurisdiction, um, if you were interested, is calculated following the school construction formula. A new grant project and transfer of funds for the county match will need to take place through the operating budget resolution 02211. I will turn it over now to Karen Bernard, who will provide additional details about the program and the targeted population to be served. Thanks. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us this morning. I wanted to, to give you a little information about the summer um, SNAP program. It started with the Summer SNAP uh, Program Act back in 2019. Due to COVID, during COVID, children were issued um, the pandemic benefits. So that's why we've had somewhat of a change for this fiscal year. So now that the children have returned to school during the time that they're out of school in the summer months, so June, July, and August, children that participate in the summer SNAP program will be issued an additional $30 during the summer and then $10 in December to help with the benefits that they're already, their household is con, you know, continually uh, eligible for. So to give a little extra money into their budget during the time that the children are not in school participating with the free lunch and breakfast programs. So what we did, we pulled information from um, Central and it was provided to us of all of the children in the zip codes of Carroll County that are currently receiving uh, food stamp benefits from the ages of 5 <coughs> to 18, which is your school age age group. So I started with the children that are in the outer areas, not out, like outside of the more popular city mm -hmm. like Westminster and Tawnytown, which currently has a summer program for the children in that area. In Westminster, the Boys and Girls Club has participated in the lunch program 
the um, summer program, and then in Tawny Town at the middle school, and I believe there's a church that is also participating. So we started with the more rural areas, like the Keymar, Union mm -hmm. Bridge, New Windsor, Marriottsville, Lineborough, the children that are in the outer areas and where they're not close to the school because they rely on their school buses to get to where the resources would be provided. Some of the cities have um, some resources that are available, but not as much as that is available here in Westminster in the city areas. So between the outer line areas, we were able to come up with a total of Thank you. Mm -hmm. So 919 children will be eligible for the benefits um, based on the funding that's provided between the county and the state. Mm -hmm. The process for contacting the households is that we will mail out information to the addresses that we currently have online. If we are not contacted back from the parents, then we will start reaching out by phone. The parents will provide their current address so that we make sure they are in actually the rural areas. And then they will be notified that the benefits will be issued each month for each child in their household. Um, I think this would be a, a great benefit for the children. We would, would deeply appreciate the county participating and partnering with the state it's a beginning of providing children in the rural areas additional benefits and making sure that they have something through the summer months. Well, Ms. Bernard, thank you yes, for this sir. briefing. It, it's very important that I like the concept of going out to the rural areas. I think a lot of times people don't realize that we have rural poverty, that poverty doesn't just exist in the urban centers. Yes. Two of the areas you mentioned, Union Bridge or New Windsor in my district, so I'm glad to see that two of the smallest municipalities in our county are getting some help in addressing their needs. And I think that the children are one of the most vulnerable populations in our community. So I'm very happy with seeing this plan coming forward. Uh, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, I know the school system lost a million dollars in funding due to Title I. And I uh, thanks to some her uh, research from Mrs. Herbert, that was uh, uh, a, a census driven I think the loss of that million dollars is there a correlation what you're doing with any thing with the school system here on those programs no all our information is based on the households that are currently receiving SNAP benefits okay just SNAP. okay is there a relationship you have with CCPS and the schools in identifying the 919 I mean is there a you know and because that's that's only one part of the population, you know. Um, so you're pulling it from lots of different places, but a large meat of it, I would expect, does come from CCPS. So the pro this program is not um, a partnership with the, the public schools, mm -hmm. but the public schools have a connection with the um, DHS Central, mm -hmm. where they're providing the um, summer program to the, the uh, Boys and Girls Club, mm -hmm. the churches in Westminster and Tawny Town, and uh, elementary school in Westminster and Tawny Town. So that's the connection where the um, public schools are working with the uh, GHS Central to provide the benefit. So that's why I felt the children in the rural areas outside of that, that targeted group would benefit from the summer program. Although this is um, a large amount, 919, um, it's always a challenge that we're not all inclusive, that there's still children slipping through the cracks because we're identifying, like you said, churches and organizations like Boys and Girls Club that we can partner with and social services here are identified kids. Um, how do we, in your opinion, make it more uh, 
how, how do we ensure less kids are falling through the cracks? What, what relationships do you think we need to uh, either enhance or adjust or, you know, besides us allocating money, what can we do for you? I think if we have a way of communicating to people in that rural area uh -huh. that the SNAP benefits are available, what we find is a lot of people will start an application and not follow through. Mm -hmm. We could encourage um, people to follow through and provide the information. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I'm just thinking of how to resource that. <clears throat> and you come back and say, hey, here is a marketing plan that coupled with this, we're lessening the kids that are in the cracks of you know our community that are not benefiting from the, the SNAP program. I mean, I definitely applaud this, but for every child, my concern is there's another. Um, and I'm looking at, okay, what's the what's the vision in taking the next steps so but okay. this is grant just money given to the family yes. it's a, the food stamp benefits the food stamp yes. it, it's they have to buy food with it it can't yes. be used yes. for other they things. have okay. to um, purchase food if they don't purchase any other type of non-food items yeah. like you know no tobacco items no yeah. toiletries all just, food items, and it has to be food that you go home and prepare. They can't purchase pre-prepared food. Yeah. That's why I was just making sure the money goes to the kids or mm -hmm. chances you of getting to the kids. Or you said you're reaching out to the urban areas. Yes. Which is great, but and you're not, but you're not looking at the area, say in Westminster or Tawnytown, too, that you mentioned. What happens if you have people there that can't access um, Boys and Girls Club or whatever uh, groups or offering the lunches and so forth is there any way to reach out to them to say you know or, or, or can they reach out to you because maybe I can't get into the Boys and Girls Club and I can't do this but I still have the need what happens to those people so if they contact us um, it's if you know the need comes to us normally it's communicated from our social workers because they they are our foot and our voices out in the community they will come back to the local or they'll email us and let us know the particulars of a family or household and then that's when we start to make sure that we link and connect because we have per, uh, non-perishable items in the local that we take out to the community we always have a paper application that the social workers can grab and take to um, households that don't have access to the internet because right now, you know, the, the connection is being able to get online and place that application. Right. But we get information from households that don't have the internet or it's not a good connection. They've had issues with the system. So we always fall back on paper. We haven't let that go. But, the, but those families would not be eligible for the, the food stamps, basically. You would find a way to get them the actual food to their house. Is that what you're saying? So we would take an application <laughs> for food stamps for them. And the reason why we have the non-perishables in our local is so that <clears throat> while that application is being processed, because there are requirements to meet eligibility, sure. then that's kind of like our fill gap. Because we'll say, okay. well, you know, here's some items to hold you over until we can get that benefit to you and get that call. So even if they're not in the 919 people Absolutely. identified, they Absolutely. can still qualify yes. again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. We we've been in this program before, right? Mm -hmm. This is a new program. Or no, is this Not is a brand new one. Yeah, this is this is Okay. A new program. That's why I was confused because we I've I don't remember taking something out a supplemental budget in order to do this. That's why I was Yeah, this is no. brand new. Right? Okay. And I think what you're thinking of is probably the grab and go meals that the school system did and that was with COVID funding and yeah, that, okay. that is okay. To, to our understanding is not coming back this year because that right. funding is not going to be reallocated. Okay. So that's why this benefit coming in to Carol um, is particularly important this year mm -hmm. because that benefit is not is not here. Okay. Well, what, I, wish, I wish they had a better way to do this. Uh, you know, trying to match it up with the school construction formula seems a little bit crazy to me. Yeah. Uh, and it goes to your point <clears throat> about who you're reaching out to. Right. Because uh, I'm not sure that that's the right method of reaching out but perhaps that will change uh, maybe as it gets a little bit more legs 
DSS will try to find a better way to, uh, to, to get that money to where it needs to go or get the stamps to where it needs to go. So, yeah, the school construction formula, yeah, they're just looking for a wealth adjusted way of doing this. Right. The right. formula already exists, right. so they just grabbed that. So they, they grabbed onto that. But that, I, I'm yeah. not so sure I. But I'm, not, it, I'm not sure I understand that part of it. I know, mm. but, but so. at least it starts a collaborative approach. I yeah. mean, or at least it starts an approach. As you hear from us, um, I believe, you know, obviously we're very well supporting this. We're just looking at, okay, how to be more collaborative to ensure that all our children are served or at least minimize the, the numbers. You know what I, saying? I did want to just say that I think because we are very connected in Carroll right. County, our local management board um, has representatives from all of the different agencies and then we have our local care team where they bring um, children in and their families to talk about resources and connect them um, with community resources to help them remain in their homes when they're um, having when they have um, some different kinds of care needs but one of the pieces there is that we're very in touch with DSS their social workers participate and are on those boards and on the local care team and it's not just their um, agency, it is all the child serving agencies across Carroll County that we're connected with. So we have a, pul we, we have a pulse with them and, and kind of touch back and forth with them with Gabby and through all of the work that we do where if there is a disconnect, if, if there is a gap, if there are kids in a certain area that aren't, aren't having access to those resources, we're gonna know that from those meetings and from those teams, and then we're gonna reach out and see what we can do, or also refer them right over to Karen and her team um, at DSS for that assistance, or to the local food pantries, or Carol Food Sunday, see what we can right. do. Uh, we have a lot of different pieces to the puzzle where even though it's not maybe a typical resource that we provide on an ongoing basis, when there's a need, these agencies step up to provide it. And yeah. it so. I'll move the Board of Commissioners approve the submission of the application acceptance uh, the award of the FY23 Summer Supplemental uh, Nutrition Assistance Program and approve operating budget resolution 0-22.11 to transfer funds to a new grant project for the required county match. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. And Selene, I agree with you. We have a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Um, now we just have to kind of look at the the stitching and bringing it all together um, so I guess we can so. anticipate this being a budget item from now on right because we, snaps not going anywhere that this the funding continues to come through so again mm -hmm. this is federal funding that's coming down right so. okay so yeah, I hope they come up as, with a better as long as they offer it to us yeah. we will be coming back yeah. to and I hope they come up with a better formula yeah. because we're at 50 yeah. percent here almost uh, yeah. you know, and even we, with that formula unfortunately the funds that we received the reason we had to come up with a plan is because we would not be receiving enough dollars to cover everybody. Got it. Yeah. So that's why we had to come up with a plan. Okay. Yeah. I think this is a great idea. Hopefully. I'm just yeah. worried about people that might not be contacted or might right. be left out. Those Absolutely. are the people I'm worried about right now. And I know you'll do your best to do all of that. I, I, I have I have faith that that will happen. But there's always somebody that never hears about it. You know what I mean? That really needs the assistance. Those are the people I'm worried about. But I think this is a great idea. The, the other piece also that I did want to mention, Carroll County Public Schools, with their distribution, their email distribution list, where they push out those flyers to all the parents across uh -huh. Carroll County Public Schools, that is an excellent resource for us yep. um, that we use all the time. I'm sure you do as well. I've seen your flyers push out as I have a, a child in the system. Um, and and it's, it's just been, that has been a great help to market our programs, our services, and the benefits that are available. Before we take the vote, you know, we have a tremendous networking system, which you expressed, and I heard the food pantries mentioned. Are our food pantries under stress? Should we solicit more people to offer some support for them? How do they look at this point in time? We have a, um, a network of people in our agency who call, uh, how long, like every two weeks, I believe it is. Yes. Um, she's contacting those food pantries every two weeks to make sure mm -hmm. Are they encountering any problems? Is there any shortage? Are their hours still the same? And then we push that information out to the local partners so that they know if there's a you know volunteer need to get that the word out, things of that nature. Good. So they're all part of the networking system. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further discussion? Seen hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck.
Thank you okay, very much. now let's walk into FY23 agency sessions. First up. Before we get a few things to oh, okay. set this up yeah, before please. we get in, into it. Okay, first, just so there's no confusion, I'm not Roberta Wyndham. Uh, <laughs> if you need to check, I have better hair, so. <laughs> Uh, good, good. Okay, I know you said that. But okay, you have a big binder in front of you, just so you know what's in there. There's a, a, a blue page in plastic. Everything behind there is just agency information. It's not specifically related to what we're going to talk today, but just general information about these agencies. In the front section, in order of the people that you're going to be seeing, are the issues that they're bringing to you. And uh, for people who might be watching this, uh, just to explain what this is, you know, the management and budget brought the commissioners a recommended budget and operating plan. Not everything, of course, made it into that recommendation. So the agencies that are coming today are saying to the commissioners, there's something we believe ought to be in the budget that was not included in the recommendation, and we want you to consider that. All right, we're good to go. Where's that in here? Where's what? <laughs> the agencies that are coming for us, what they're asking, is that in this, in this binder? Yes. Um, the behind the first tab, the second page, you'll see circuit court. First tab, second page. Yellow piece of paper. Yeah, I'll see circuit court. Keep, keep going. Keep, keep, keep going into the blue tabs. There you go. Yeah, yeah keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Oh, yes. all the way back here. <laughs> All the way. <laughs> no, this is the agency information. Okay. Oh, here's what's different. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. Uh, he is different. This, this thing yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Oh, so this is that okay. Right. Thing. There's nothing in here. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I was looking for additional information. I saw this one. Okay. Were you okay. the kid? Were you the kid in the class that always had his hand up? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Now that I know where we are, <laughs> let's go. Commissioner Frazier, you ready? Almost. Yep, let's let, let me know. Okay. Former teacher. <laughs> okay, so uh, Judge Hecker, why don't you uh, take the stand? The first Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Nice to see everybody. Yes, sir. All right. Good morning. Uh, my request of you this morning, uh, commissioners, is for funding for an additional position for a uh, person in our jury commissioner office. There's no more critical function that the circuit court performs than uh, the operation of jury trials in our county. Uh, we currently have two full-time persons in the jury office, the jury commissioner and the deputy jury commissioner. And quite honestly, um, as hard as they work, they have a difficult time keeping up with all the work. As it is, uh, in years past, uh, as you'll see from the briefing paper, in 2019, and, and I exclude 2020 since it was such an off year as a result of COVID, okay. But in 2019 alone, uh, we had to reassign, I had to reassign employees from other departments to work in the jury office. All that resulted in about 330 hours of overtime uh, that we had to pay employees. So on average, uh, we used, uh, I think it was something like on the order of 50 hours of uh, overtime uh, for these employees. Mm -hmm. We have uh, this year, I asked my jury commissioner to give me some data on how many jury trials we have scheduled from now through the end of the year. And we have an excess of 240 jury trials scheduled between now and the end of December. It works out to about an average of uh, eight a week or so. Uh, she tells me it's, uh, my jury commissioner tells me it's about just under six a day. We can't uh, conduct six jury trials a day. There are only four judges, as you know, on the circuit court. Uh, we're not all doing jury trials all the time because there are other matters that require our attention other than jury trials. But the point is that um, these cases are set on the dockets, uh, as is true most of the time. If all these cases went to trial, um, the legislature would have to probably authorize more judgeships in Carroll County. Uh, so a lot of those cases do resolve, but 
Nonetheless, the jury office is called upon to summons jurors in, jurors in, uh, so they have to get out the summons when the uh, juries come in. Of course, they have many responsibilities, including checking the jurors in, making sure the jurors get paid, conducting orientation for the jurors. Uh, my concern is that uh, at some point um, in the not too distant future, something's going to get missed, something's going to get overlooked, and our citizens uh, deserve the best service that we can possibly offer. The courts owe it to the citizens of Carroll County to uh, operate the jury office in the most efficient way possible. And if we continue at this rate, uh, understaffed as we are in the jury office, um, we're not going to be able to do that, I fear. Uh, something, again, is going to get overlooked. Uh, jurors are going to get summonsed in uh, more often than they ought to be summonsed in. Uh, we're going to miss uh, opportunities to bring jurors in. Something is going to get uh, overlooked. So uh, I, I see this as an investment in, uh, in the community, an investment in the, the court. Uh, we would want to, of course, uh, bring in the best uh, possible, uh, provide the best possible service to the community that we can do. Uh, and right now, uh, we're not staffed to do that. Uh, and of course, having to pull, aside from the overtime aspect, having to pull employees away from other jobs, in addition to creating overtime uh, issues for uh, us and for the county, takes those people away from the jobs that they were hired to do. But fortunately, you know, we have some very versatile people that we can pull in from time to time, but that's not a long-term sustainable solution, as you can imagine, having to pull somebody off of one job to do another. Uh, Judge, if mm -hmm. you can, for the public to put in perspective, what is the total volume annually of potential jurors? Not the ones that are selected, but the volume of jurors that this commissioner has to work with. Do you know? Well, what I can tell you is that, uh, so for an average criminal uh, jury trial, we probably um, will summons, in order to get a jury of 12 with one or two alternates, we'll summons in somewhere between 45 and 60 jurors because of the jury selection process in which certain jurors are uh, eliminated from jury service uh, for a variety of reasons, you obviously have to bring in enough jurors so that when those uh, certain jury panel members are excluded, you have enough uh, to seat a jury of 12 with usually one or two alter alternates. So in order to seat 14 jurors, let's say, we bring in 55 or 60. So if we, if we have eight or ten jury trials, let's say eight jury trials set each week from now through the end of the year, there's a lot of uh, individuals that the jury office is responsible for summonsing and checking in and mm -hmm. uh, all the duties attendant to each of those jurors. And there's a lot of administrative work that entitles screening those people, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, right. There's a lot of background work. So there are certain jury qualifications, of course, set by law, right? You have to be at least 18. You have to be a citizen of the United States. You have to be a resident of Carroll County. You can't have been uh, convicted of a crime punishable by imprisonment of more than six months. There are a lot of legal criteria, and not everyone reads their jury summonses that thoroughly, uh, unfortunately. So the jury <laughs> office is responsible for responding to uh, issues of eligibility for jury service. Uh, they're also on the front lines for jurors who request to be excused from jury service initially for whatever reason. Ultimately, those decisions are made by the court, uh, but someone has to address all of those inquiries that come in, and, and that is uh, a big part of what the jury office mm -hmm. does. And if it's not done properly, it could cause an appeal of a potential <laughs> conviction, if I'm correct. Yeah, certainly in a criminal case, if uh, juries are not seated properly and constitutionally, the result, uh, at worst, is probably right. The conviction gets reversed, the case has to get retried, and you have to bring a new group of jurors in. So actuality, this is kind of the first step in our quality control for a jury trial, would it? I would say so. Thank you. That's well put. You mentioned... Um, 
that there's currently two full time. Correct. What, what's the salary of the of these clerks? I see the the funding, total funding, but I imagine that total funding is for everything that wraps wraps around the individual, not the salaries. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I actually don't have the salary figures for our jury commissioner, our deputy yeah. court jury commissioner, with me, but I can okay. certainly get that to you. Yeah. I, yeah. And the reason is the, um, you know, it's always a challenge to recruit the right, right. individual, <clears throat> um, and the timing of recruitment, training, and then retention. Um, you you also mentioned judgeships. Is that so I'm clear, is that how many judges are here? I mean, do <coughs> different jurisdictions have different number? Oh, yeah, sure. It's based on population. So, okay. for example, uh, Baltimore County Circuit Court has 20 circuit court judges. Carroll County Circuit Court has four circuit court judges. <coughs> Frederick has five. Okay. Hartford County has six. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, to a large extent, it's uh, dictated by population and yeah. court volume. And the, the General Assembly periodically will review the need for additional yeah. judgeships. The last judgeship that was uh, created in the Circuit Court for Carroll County was the judgeship that I currently occupy. Okay. Prior to uh, 2013 or 14, there were three Circuit Court judges in Carroll County. Okay. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, okay. Any uh, other discussion? Look, I, uh, I'm keenly aware that you have uh, many priorities uh, that um, are your responsibility to attend to. I would suggest to you that uh, the uh, operation of the courts and the efficiency of the jury office is as important as any priority that I have, any priority that uh, the county has. Uh, so I'm okay. sure that you will... Um, I know you'll give it due consideration, uh, and uh, and we certainly hope you will approve the request. Absolutely. Okay. okay. The salary is thirty six thousand five hundred dollars. <throat> wow. There you Thank go. you. And uh, I just Roberta. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize. Haircut. Uh, thirty six thousand five hundred. Yeah. And that's a full time position. Is that comparable with? industry standards or are we on target yeah I, I would say it's it's yeah it's I think that we will attract somebody to do the work uh, at that salary the work that uh, we would like to have this uh, third person to do um, I don't have to tell you how difficult it is to attract uh, <laughs> new hires these days uh, yeah. uh, not only uh, for, in government but in private industry but yeah we anticipate that would be sufficient Thank you. just a reminder for you on the idea of positions you know for your internal positions we usually go through a process that leads to some recommendations to you we did not do that this year but we'll talk about that another time but for circuit court state's attorney and the sheriff uh, even in other years that they do not go through the process they just come directly to you as a separate process Okay. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a good day. Yes, well. sir. Okay. Let's move on to uh, Carroll County Board of Education. The Board of Education is requesting $4 million in ongoing revenue above the county planned amount for FY23. Could I suggest having the sh sheriff's deputy come up to escort Rob Burke out of the room? <laughs> <laughs> so, so moved. <laughs> Second. Wait, who is he? <laughs> so, uh, gentlemen, I think maybe we need a longer table. I don't know. Got, uh, we have a slide deck in front of us. Okay, have at it. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you this morning and talk about uh, our, our request um, for President Kyler's with us he's gonna uh, begin with some introductory remarks our chief operating officer John O'Neill uh, as well will provide some of the background and we look forward to some uh, discussion question and answer opportunity with you today thank you Mr. Kyler. Um, thank you <coughs> for the opportunity to present our budget request Dr. Lockhart and staff 
we'll do all the specifics. I wanted to just make some broad statements on behalf of Board of Ed. Um, as you know, you have our budget. We are requesting $4 million in ongoing revenue above the county's current plan. And as uh, Dr. Lockhart said, I'm the current president of the Board of Education, also a lifetime resident of Carroll County. I've paid taxes here since 1966. Early on, as I became a voter, I would tell people 50% uh, of our, your tax money goes to the schools. Pay attention to it. And, and the schools, as the Sheriff's Department, Fire Protection, Parks and Rec, it's all a large portion of the quality of life in Carroll County. We're also a very large um, employer. Um, we're hopeful that the state money we receive under the blueprint will pay for the requirements that we have under the first year of the blueprint. As I'm sure you guys are skeptical, um, there's so many unknowns this early in the year always, but with blueprint, what are they going to mandate? What are they going to fund? What's going to come out of Carroll County's pockets instead of the state pockets? So it's a lot of unknowns. We've identified $6.8 in ongoing costs for next year. So the 6.4 in the county plan would pay for those increased inflationary costs. But without additional support from you, we will be unable to effectively address employee compensation beyond our teachers or to make any other improvements to the school system. So we, we really need the money. And I know COVID's been tough on everybody, but we lost slightly over $4 million in ongoing money during the COVID times. And as you guys are, are more aware than I am, that's ongoing money. So in 10 years, that's $40 million. That's a lot of money coming, coming out of our budget. And we, we really need your help. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. I appreciate the overview. Um, as I said, John is going to present revenue and expenditure uh, summaries for you, as well as some other background information. As we've listened uh, to some of your deliberations, we know there's some discussions and questions that we've heard, and we want to make sure we address any and all of those that you may have. So, John, if you would. Sure. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Commissioners. Um, I know that you, you've received this some of this information before, including at the recent joint meeting, so I'll try to move quickly and, and then you can um, have time for your questions of us. Uh, this slide just shows what the to total revenue increase would be under the Board of Ed's requested budget, both state revenue and the county requested revenue, including the $4 million above the, the plan that's been mentioned. And um, for the next couple of, of um, screenshots, we wanted to at least take a minute and explain when Dr. Lockhart or Mr. Kyler has said we've identified $6.8 million in inflationary costs or increased costs for next year. We wanted to take just a moment and um, detail those out for you so you had a sense in, in this slide and the next one do that. So the first line here relates to the board's costs for insurance as most of that would be employee health care. Um, the board's made some significant changes to try to address some some issues with our bus contractors as I'm sure you know we don't um, we don't own and operate our own bus fleet we contract with about approximately 40 independent uh, business contractors in the county and and so you, the, the school bus drivers and bus assistants you see on the road those are their buses and their employees and we have a business relationship with them we've been experiencing some challenges there um, and so the board felt the need to address the, um, the reimbursement formula through which we, we pay those bus contractors. This, this amount reflects the change that was made there. That if you're looking for a frame of reference, that's on a, approximately a $21 million budget category. So that's the, uh, the type of increase there. Um, the next item, Title I pickup. Uh, money comes to us for what we sometimes refer to as Title I. You, you may sometimes hear, hear us in our budget discussions refer to compensatory education. Um, generally, that relates to students who are eligible for free and reduced meals or at a certain um, reference point to the federal poverty line. Um, and, we, and we do receive some state aid for what the state tends to call compensatory ed, but we also receive a little bit of federal grant money. It's not a lot of federal grant money. Uh, and in the last two years, um, using the reference point that the federal government uses for our relative poverty or our relative wealth, depending on how you want to view it, we no longer qualify for about a million dollars in federal Title I aid that we had previously received. And so 
where that aid goes is to is in the form of services to students in our three Title I schools. So in other words, employees, teachers or assistants or, or positions that are serving those students. Those students haven't changed. They haven't gone away. There's not fewer of them, but our relative wealth has gone away in the federal formula. And so in order to keep those services in those schools, we have to make up the, the difference in funding for the uh, for the federal Title One money that so, went away. So this adds up to six point four. This slide and the next add up to six point eight. So you're saying that you still have the same number of students that are eligible for Title One that you've had in the past, but they've cut the funding. I'm saying that we still have the same students in the schools. I did, but the same number of students. What I'm asking. Yes. But so but then how? I, I mean, I'm not the federal, County's but really how do they cut the money then? Because they the different formula, the, no, they use the same formula. We've been, re, regardless of any other factors, pa pandemic notwithstanding, we're the um, we are actually by far now. We used to be neck and neck with Howard pretty much every year for who had the lowest free and reduced meal population in the state. We are now, you know, there's now a gap between us and Howard. We have by far the lowest free and reduced meal population in the state. It's what the state calls relative wealth, where they rank okay. the wealth of counties. The federal government does the same thing for their Title I grant, and they, whether we agree or not, they say Carroll County is now wealthier, or your percentage of students who would qualify under our census data is a lower percentage. The number of the kids in the schools haven't changed, the families haven't necessarily changed, but the way in which the federal government passes through their title one money so the percentage of students have changed that's what you're saying that meet the requirement the the overall wealth of Carroll County has changed yeah relative. but you just said percentage they use it the they use the overall students have changed then of title not one. of students of that's percentage of wealth is this census driven yes this, so the this census is. drove this to relook at this and now we have less students that qualify, basically. We, it's not less students. We, we're just, in their minds, wealthier as a county and therefore not, not worthy. Worthy is not the best word, but we don't receive the same amount of money because they say Carroll County as a whole is wealthier. This, this is just the federal version of what we've been through for a decade with the state, where for the state foundation formula, they look at comparative wealth and say, when you rank the counties and add up wealth tax base and divide it by the number of people carol's way up here now we don't feel wealthier you don't you don't feel like you have more money to get to give out but when they do the relative rankings that's what they conclude this is just the federal version of of of, and, and of here, what happens at the state here's what we know as a result of our three title one schools we have some valuable um, staff resources that we use Title I funding to support those schools, and we believe it would be detrimental to pull those out uh, of our Title I schools at this time. We still have students with needs, and we believe our, our, our funds are being well spent in supporting those students' needs. Ask any of the teachers or principals or even families there if you said, well, you know, without the additional million dollars that we're, we're not getting from the federal government, we're you know, how would everybody be if we removed these, you know, X 11. number of, of, is it 11? 11, 11 uh, positions from these schools. They would tell you it would be fairly catastrophic for them um, because these are schools that we've identified with some higher, more pressing needs. Social, emotionally, academic, wraparound services and supports. And so we felt it very important to continue to include in our budget. We can't control the fact that the, the, the census and the federal government isn't giving us what what they did we believed it to be important to include in our budget to find a way to make it happen for the kids and, the, and families in those schools and, and i think your point about the state is well taken i felt like and again obviously i've paid more attention the last three years it just seems like we constantly get punished by either the state or the federal because you guys care too much about schools we care too much about schools we do too, too good of a job, and then when you hear Carroll County, we're in the middle size, we're like the middle child, and now we're too wealthy. Put a Jan on the Brady Bunch. Is, is this funds that were used to provide meals throughout COVID? No. No, these, these funds, um, 
basically provides staffing in the in the schools oh, that meet the Title One threshold. Okay. This, no. yeah, this is eleven positions. So these are eleven people who have been teaching in in these three schools for years, but being paid for by fe federal Title One grant money. And we now know there's not going to be enough um, grant money to sustain eleven of them. So if we don't make it up locally. We, we would have to cut 11 teachers out of those schools. Okay, and what does this do to class size in these programs if you don't get the funding? It, it would it would increase in many cases the, the class size. Do you have enough to how how many or anything? You haven't predicted that part. You just assured you're going to get the money. <laughs> what I mess with? Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I, I was just wondering because you know you lose 11. How many students? in this whole thing uh, it would increase class size by two three four ten right it would it would increase class size but not all of the positions are necessarily classroom teachers i mentioned right. social emotional supports and um you know uh, i know school, psych and teachers. school psychologists so we we've added some of these mental health and and, and well-being positions as well as class size reduction um i don't have that exact breakdown here in front of me for you but you added 19 last year or you could possibly you wanted to use that bring 19 on at one time for these support areas but now you're losing 11 of those possible in addition to those you wanted to bring on to assist through COVID right the, the positions we added last year we'll talk about in a minute we, we used uh, federal funds yeah. to, to do that mm -hmm. um, you're gonna see we've we've tried to We've stretched our budget as far as we can. We've tried to use one-time funds where we can. We recognize that's a yeah. cliff, but at the same time, we have a couple years to make an impact with those federal dollars, and we didn't want to sit around and not spend it for two years trying to help kids while we could. Our issue is ongoing funding. I have to agree with Mr. Kyler. It seems like Carroll County gets penalized for doing a good job. I also have to wonder if the formula for this distribution of funding is somehow flawed that if we're viewed on the overall as a wealthy county we get less funding when we actually have people at the lower level in need of it in the poverty and it's a shame that the formula is penalizing us and our ability to help those people that are at a lower level in need also appreciate you including the mental health and behavioral services in this and I'd like to talk about a little bit if you can about the impact that we've had that we've seen over the last two years of covid and everything going on upon our students and how potentially imperative it is that we help these students at this point in time recover from the pandemic and get them situated yeah we we recognize that as significantly important we we were talking about mental health and wellness long before the pandemic yeah you we and held, i both did in the very beginning yes we held town halls um and had lots of really good conversation with our board members, with our uh, community, with our teachers and staff about the needs for our students in terms of mental health, um, social emotional health, and then supports for, for our classroom teachers. Our classroom teachers have a really important job to do, um, and it's really hard when they're trying to play six, seven, eight different roles just to get to teaching and learning have to do it because you know if kids aren't available um, for learning it, it's hard to teach it's hard to learn so we've been talking about this for a long time Commissioner Boucher um, our our challenge is um, right before the pandemic we actually started to make a dent um, we added six special education teachers to our to our overall uh, ongoing operational uh, allotment um, the hope was to continue to chip away uh, we looked at counselors, we looked at psychologists, we looked at mental health, uh, other mental health, either therapists, behavior therapists, supports. Um, our challenge has been um, uh, some of the requirements that you'll see that, that John will share and our lack of ongoing dollars. We, we also have to be able to compensate our employees. Um, we have requirements to do that, but we also want to be competitive in doing that. Um, and we really need to do that so that we, we could create positions but we're not going to be able to attract and keep people if we can't you pay get them what you pay for competitively right right so i don't know if you want to kind of continue with our sure. expenditure summary there sure the last item on this screen deals with uh, the blueprint actually and so there's something under the the, the blueprint legislation that's uh, probably more generally referred to as a career ladder 
that involves a lot of components over time, um, one of which is paying a salary add-on to teachers who have or, or who are obtaining National Board certification. So this is an amount of money that's coming uh, to us from the state saying, you know, your cost in year one of the blueprint for the career ladder is $900,000. Now, it's probably worth pausing here and then just carry this forward throughout this whole discussion that we're at a weird place right now as a state with the blueprint where it's law and there are governance bodies forming and beginning to meet. Um, and at the state level, the state is moving back its timelines on the blueprint. So for the big things that the state has to approve, there's a bill in, it's House Bill 1450, next time Mike's here, um, that would push back sort of the state timelines. None of our timelines at the local levels are pushed back. And it's a little bit frustrating. I suppose it's a little bit expected because it's a shift in, in how education works and is funded, and it takes a minute to get it up and running. But where we all sit, not just us, but every local board of ed, is in year one, we have budget decisions to make, we have collective bargaining decisions to make, which we'll loosely touch on in a minute. We have a plan that we know we'll have to develop and turn into the state, and that's what's been pushed back for future approval but we don't have a lot of clear guidance from the state at all on what are these expectations gonna be. And so one of the great fears we have, or at least I have, is sometimes when you're in state meetings, there's comments made that would suggest that the blueprint funding that's coming to us under a formula, so think about columns in a spreadsheet, this much money for this, this much money for that, this much money for something else, all of that adds up to the 10.25 million here but increasingly it sounds like we should be concerned that the state's gonna consider that money restricted by program. So if we gave you this much money for career ladder, you're gonna to have to show that you've spent it on career ladder. If we gave you this much money for college and career ready, you're gonna to have to show us that and so forth and so on. And that's gonna be a real challenge for us because we're not, for Carol, because we're not getting, I know to me or to you or to anybody who might watch this, 10.2 million is a ton of money but in the scope of our budget and the size of our school system and relative to other school systems, that's not a lot of money to implement the requirements that, they, that they're saying have to be met. And if this money turns out to be restricted, that's gonna be a big deal in a lot of ways, one of which is relative to meeting Kerwin's salary requirements. Um, you know, what, what Mr. Kyler was saying early on is we're, we're optimistic that this $10.2 million will pay for our blue, for the requirements that we're going to have to meet under the blueprint in year one, we hope that's gonna be hard to do if the money's restricted and it's gonna be hard to meet the salary requirement for teachers under the blueprint either way. The money can't be restricted for us to do that. There'll be more on that in a minute. Yeah, but um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, go ahead. Well, I was gonna to move to the last okay, I was expenses. Say, but besides the 10.2 million the state is giving you, they're also requiring Carroll County now to give you seven and a half million dollars more than last year for this, for the blueprint. That uh, bill just passed four days ago, I think, or whatever, last as Well, last that's, that's the suggested Wednesday. Yeah, well, I thought it was passed. I don't know. But anyway, paid. seven, so. seven and a half million dollars more than we're required to give you now, which I'm okay with, but what it's not, like I said, it's not in our initial budget there. Yeah, I can't, I'm, I'm not able to speak no. to that without knowing what you're referring to. And that's, that's the perspective adjusted blueprint education money that they're anticipating in FY23. That we would have to, to pay to, to meet the blueprint requirements for year one. May, Mayco threw that chart out last week, so we're just still looking at it. So yeah, we'll have to look yeah. at it. Yeah, I, I You're saying an additional 7.5? From yeah, last no. year, over last year's, well, right. what we paid last year, they expect Carroll County to pay additional $7.5 <coughs> million dollars more for this coming budget. Now, every county is listed about what they're supposed to give, and, and or some don't have to give any. And we were supposed to be in that category, but anyway, now ours is seven and a half million more. But, you know, with, we're already giving 6.8 or something, 6.4, so we don't have to make up the difference if this passes. I thought it passed, but maybe it didn't pass no, already. No, the, the ink's still wet on that paper, but that's the anticipated increase that we'll be responsible for. 
opportunity. I, I, right. I just can't yeah. comment without yeah. knowing what. I'll, I'll connect with Ted yeah, later. You'll have to, yeah. See. yeah. Um, I'll try to do the other expenditures real quick. This, these, this is the last set of things that gets to the total of six point eight million. Um, East Bar pickup that refers to a program that exists at um, our Judy Center, which is a pre-K uh, program at Robert Moton Elementary School. We have, for many years, had a program with the health department to provide um, parent support, family support in the homes. We call it our parents, parents, as, parents teachers. as teachers program. The money from the health department is going away. So this is sort of like the Title I uh, uh, example in the sense that this program exists, the people are there providing the service, but the money that, that used to come to us from the, through the health department is no longer available for us to continue that program, which we feel is very valuable. That's 151, um, almost 152,000. Non-public placements refers to the cost of uh, the Board of Ed's cost of tuition for our students who we bus out of county to non-public special education schools. It, this doesn't necessarily mean that the number of students has changed dramatically. That, that fluctuates a little bit every year, obviously, but it does mean that the tuition rates that these institutions charge have gone up, and so there's a cost share. Most of the cost share is local. The state pays a small percentage. The overall tuition has gone up. This just reflects us covering the increase to tuition for our students who go to non-public placement schools. Um, That's a legal requirement, right? Yes. Right. If, we, if we're unable to meet, I should probably let an educator speak to this, but if we're unable to meet the student's needs in his or her IEP right. and one of our own schools or programs, we have to send them to a site where they can meet the student's needs. Correct. Yeah, I'm sorry. Nope, you, you got it. <laughs> um, Two, two FTE full-time equivalent or two full-time positions. Uh, this, this would be for career and tech as we complete the uh, first phase of construction, which is the addition that Commissioner Boucher was just there touring the other day. We try to maintain a ratio of one custodian per 20,000 square feet of space to manage and clean. Um, that addition increases the overall square footage at, at career and tech, and so we're, we're trying to program in two additional custodians to maintain that workload for the custodial staff. And then lastly, insurances. This would be things other than the health care that you saw on the first slide. So workers' compensation, general, general liability, all the similar kinds of insurances you carry as an organization we carry. That's our, that's our expected increase. So that gets you to the $6.8 million that Mr. Kyler referred to in sort of known expenses. And when you put that next to the asked for revenue, or in the case of the state, expected revenue, that leaves the Board of Ed with a balance of $13.7 million to work with. But there at the bottom, that $13.7 doesn't account for any of the major things other than the $900,000 for the career ladder. Anything for salaries for any employees, other blueprint requirements, anything. We're still working on things with the bus contractors, any of those needs, or other system priorities. And largely, those are going to fall under student support and mental health. But we can talk about them a little bit. And so this slide is intended to just give you a sense of the kind of priorities the Board of Ed has been discussing. In the case of employee compensation, this is not meant to reflect anything that is happening in collective bargaining or in any way, uh, you know, share publicly a parameter of collective bargaining. We're, we're bargaining in a confidential sense. These are not numbers that, these are numbers to give you a gauge of of um, when you look at the size of our organization, the number of teachers and other employees that we have, uh, you know, if the Board of Ed wanted to consider these kinds of increases for employee compensation, that's that's the figure. Uh, it's I think it's just a difference in we're we're a very large employer in the county, the, the you know the size of the organization. So if the board wants to give a step increment to all of its employees who are eligible for a step, that will cost them five point two million dollars, and. You know, five percent for a for a raise um, seems to be. There's a lot of discussion. If you talk to union folks or, or other county school systems, that inflation is somewhere around seven in a lot of people's minds. That other systems have to look at trying to settle at five or above. So we're we're just using that as nothing more than a frame of reference. But when you add up, you, you know, four thousand and some employees, that's that's what it costs. So it doesn't take very long down this list of priorities and in fact you can't get past employee compensation before the Board of Ed could easily have committed the 13.7 million dollars even if you funded the full request including the additional four. The third uh, line there refers very specifically to a blueprint requirement. Uh, every 
not just us, every Maryland school system is required to increase the value of its teacher salary scale by 10 percent between um, 2019 and fiscal 25 or July 1st, 2024. Our estimate of how much we have left to close to fill that or finish that 10% requirement is $4.7 million. So that's a very specific teacher salary uh, requirement. Uh, I already mentioned how we're struggling right now, lacking great guidance, clear guidance from the state, either from the Accountability Implementation Board or even the State Department of Ed. So we're very concerned about what other items might be required of us in the first year of the blueprint. We're trying to use a million dollars as a frame of reference to work with that. Um, Commissioner Weaver, I think you mentioned what, what did we do with the ESSER money, the federal money that we received relative to the pandemic. Most of it was programmed into summer recovery last summer and this coming summer, and what we call um, extended learning opportunities during the school year, tutoring, <clears throat> which is right. the after school uh, intervention or tutoring program we're running. Most of that money was programmed in to, to pay for that and for transportation for that to get the kids there and get them home. Um, the rest of the money, this, this $1.6 million, has been programmed into our budget for um, positions in our schools to try to help with student recovery in real time during the school day, to try to deal with shifts in class sizes as we kind of, like a lot of counties, we had that weird dip in enrollment and then enrollment came back, but in some, in some schools enrollment didn't dip at all and in others it did dip and then started bouncing back throughout the, you know, throughout each school year as, as parents or families became more comfortable with sending kids back or maybe not comfortable in pulling kids out. We were trying to still manage, you know, students' needs and meet class size. So we had some teaching positions here. We had um, positions we called quarantine success coaches whose primary job it is to work with the students who are either not in school or are in quarantine because of a COVID uh, yeah. situation and help them and their families find the resources they need in the schools. Right. We were trying to bridge that time that was very challenging uh, where we were required to have either students out or um, because of either COVID or close contact and making sure they were kept up um, and connected, trying to take uh, some of that off of our, our teachers and supporting our, our staff. And so we felt that was very valuable. Like I said, we used a lot of the one-time money to try to have a bridge um, so that we weren't that much <laughs> further behind with some of the needs that we were seeing. How successful do you rate our recovery program in Carroll County? Well, we'll we're actually bringing an update um, at the April board meeting for um, extended learning opportunity, which has been going on. We had a fall session. We had a... Uh, a spring session that they'll soon be wrapping up um, and we reviewed our summer recovery last year we feel it's been very beneficial um, to have students back in it was a it was a pretty big operation last year we had a few thousand kids um, join us over the summer as well as compensatory services for special education students of course extended school year for special education students um, I think the work that our teachers have done in addition to extended learning opportunities here during the school year has been incredible and we've tried to utilize every one of these folks to help in that effort and so we've got some good data to show that if you remember we were sort of mired in the the slide if you will about how many you know we were providing reports of what the pandemic was doing to us in terms of not being in school how many more f's we were getting out all that is reversing course and reversing trend now um, so we see huge benefit from the from the federal dollars that we've invested to support students. Well, we're not done. We're not. Uh, we're not done. Like John outlined, we've we've got work again this summer, and then also headed back into the school year in the fall as well. So that continues. Okay. And then another thing that that we have to think about relative to those positions is there's a blueprint requirement over time that we have to change the percentage of time mm -hmm. teachers teach. Um, to decrease the amount of time each teacher would be teaching students directly so that the amount of time that teachers can um, uh, can collaborate and work on planning and work with other educators or perhaps families so that's you know that's not a this year blueprint requirement it's a future blueprint requirement so you know one of the concerns that I have at least and I know Steve does as we think about what the blueprints going to mean we do have these positions that we were able to fund with the federal money to meet stu students needs now it, it will be a shame to have to cut them 
in a fiscal year or two, only to then begin to replace them with the requirement of staff needed to meet the blueprint requirement over time. So that's one of those weird, <coughs> weird blueprint. That's not a blueprint issue, but it kind of ultimately is a blueprint issue. The next item, three years ago, three fiscal years ago, the Board of Ed made a decision to fund some positions that were deemed um, high priorities for uh, supporting schools. This included a substance abuse coordinator, a security coordinator, a student health coordinator, um, a behavioral student behavioral support, and then some folks who could be in the schools to help with the technology. We were turning out laptops for a lot of a lot of uh, students. Um, it's frustrating when you have a laptop and it won't turn on and there's nobody there to help you get it connected mm -hmm. to the network or whatnot. Um, so the Board of Ed made a decision to fund those, I think it was nine total positions mm -hmm. for three years. And then we would assess how they were, uh, how successful they were, and whether or not we would have funding to continue on F fiscal 23. So next year would be the last year that the board had allocated fund balance for that. So by the end of 23, we have to figure out what we're going to do next. I would, I would just say personally for some of those folks, if they and no one planned on a pandemic, or at least I didn't, but if a couple of them hadn't existed as we hit it into the pandemic, I'm not sure what we would have done in those two years. So um, they met their return on investment uh, for me. Uh, bus contractors, we've talked about trying to improve the formula to keep buses on the road. Uh, there's some, still some things out there we've been trying to work on with, with uh, the bus contractors that would total about a half a million dollars. And then the, the last item, and again, we realize 13 doesn't compare to 28. So the the thing here is to show what would the Board of Ed do with the revenue if they had to. They'd figure out their priorities among all of these things if they, if they have the opportunity. But a couple of years ago, we had a very open public process uh, to work on budget priorities, not just that year, but long term, took a lot of public feedback. I think some of the commissioners attended some of those sessions. And out of those sessions, the board prioritized, which it's maintained, never been able to fund yet, but maintained a series of priorities that if you added them up today would total $3.1 million. Most of, that, uh, most of that had to deal with direct student support for the students with the highest needs. So increased special educators, guidance, increased guidance counselors in schools, school psychologists, behavioral, um, behavioral support uh, positions to help students with, with those yep. kinds of needs. And I think some technology support as well because we're basically putting a more or less a one-to-one -one ratio of devices out now, but we don't have, we never increase the staff to support those devices in schools. You, yeah, you, you captured it. Um, and as I said earlier, um, I guess it was two budget cycles ago, we, we actually started the first dent in that priority list with providing six special ed positions to our ongoing operating budget. But in the meantime, what we've had to do because we don't have enough ongoing money is we've had to try to find one-time sources. And like I said, I think it was better to try to take advantage of those and try to get supports to students and schools now while we can um, and not sit on those funds or not use them to directly impact students. Um, but we still have the, that list of priorities. We still have, as John has outlined, the compensation needs um, for our system. Um, and, and uh, you know, if we were given an additional $4 million, the, the, you can see the, the total that we'd have to work with of 13 goes very quickly in the first two lines um, of what you have there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the menu of things that the Board of Ed is grappling with as needs and priorities, and this menu of things is where they would figure out what they could do and how to set their priorities. And, and they'll have to do that anyway, regardless of the amount of funding. This, this is what they'll be working on uh, even as we move to May for a final reconciliation. Um, at one of your recent meetings, you, you had some conversation, a little bit of conversation about how many positions we may have added or subtracted from our budget over the years. So. In every one of our budget documents, our, our final budget book, there's a single page in each budget book that shows, that takes that entire budget by all of those major categories and condenses in one place the t overall change of FTE or full-time positions in the budget. I, I took those pages from each budget for fiscals, fiscal year 17 um, to present 
and summarized it in this format so, so that you might have this information. Anything in a parenthesis was an overall reduction in FTE to the budget or position to the budget. Anything that's not in a parenthesis was an increase. And then I broke it into, although it is sort of like this on that sheet in each budget, I broke it into operating budget or what we sometimes call ongoing revenue, restricted budget, which mostly is grants, federal or state, and then other, which could be food services or some unique things like the uh, positions we just spoke about from fund balance. But um, in terms of ongoing positions, um, the, the only increase are the six special ed teachers that the Board of Ed added in fiscal year 21. Um, the, in the restricted category, we've had requirements both pre blueprint and mm -hmm. since the blueprint to phase in pre-k expansion so the the good news about those state requirements are it costs the board of ed up front in that first year but then you do receive the money from the state to pay for that in the subsequent year so we're sort of chasing our tail but at least we're we're receiving the money in the subsequent year as we phase in pre-k expansion and how we've been doing that is site by site where we already <coughs> Where we already have half day pre K, we've been incrementally increasing those half day programs to full day programs. We're we're continuing that at three sites again next year. Um, the the blueprint TSI that was intervention tra transitional supplemental, supplemental instruction. If you if you remember, especially those of you who are vested in Annapolis, before the blueprint became the law, there was the blueprint phase in um, bills. These were programs under that. Uh, for 21-22 temporary federal funds, those that's that 1.6 million in ESSER money, Commissioner Weaver, that we were discussing. That's a breakout of those, and also in 21-22, this is a good example. We do this periodically if we can. Uh, we we usually can't, but when we can, in the world of special ed, we have to provide the required services to students in their in their IEP, whether we can hire people to do it or not. So, we often can't hire enough speech language pathologists ourselves or uh, nurses might be an example um, or even sometimes special educators special <laughs> educators physical therapists occupational therapists those kinds of services and when we can't hire people to provide those services we still have to provide those services so we have to go to outside service providers contractors who we say you know mr rothstein we need a spe uh, speech language pathologist here's the money you require us to pay you per hour to send them in on rare occasion, some of those folks actually want to come work for us instead of working through a service provider. And whenever we can hire them, we do because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to have them as an employee than to pay the high hourly rate. So that shows things like that year show up as a change in FTE, which it technically is, but it's not a change in human being who is providing services to the. Uh, to the students and that's and and actually realizes the savings to the system just going uh, back up um, school security are we talking SROs no no okay so what are we talking yeah that you're on fiscal 20 2021 mm -hmm. those were the nine positions funded by fund balance for for a period of three years that was a second person to at that time assist Dwayne Williams so that was a, okay. we have a, we have a supervisor yep. of security that's a coordinator um, same thing with student health. We have a supervisor of student health who yep. supervises nurses. That's a coordinator, coordinator of substance abuse, a school psychologist, and then the, the balance, which would be, I guess, four or five, were technology support. Okay. Those are the nine positions that are committed for at least the next fiscal yep. year. Thanks. And, and then for, for the budget that's before you as proposed, one, we've already... One, one oh. quick question. So what, what's the net change in people we've had since... What's the net minus? So, in employees? these, for ongoing revenue, for the money coming from the county, it would be minus 90. Minus 90 in those five. So, six it's years. about, it's been, been about 90 positions eliminated. In, in those years. In the, the, years. The decade before that, it was a couple hundred. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Before that, it was more. Okay. What happens to these temporary funded positions, the 64 of them? They just go away when the money goes away yes so um, the quarantine success coaches so if there are any quarantine success coaches watching this my human resources <laughs> people are about to get um, quarantine success coaches were funded for just this year mm -hmm. so we we are already um, 
if there's a vacancy, we're not filling that vacancy at this point in the year. And we're already looking to say, okay, in our overall workforce of instructional assistants, if somebody retires or somebody's resigning at the end of the year, one of those quarantine success coaches has to go into mm -hmm. that into that role. And we'll have to do the same thing with the teaching positions. They are budgeted with federal funds for one more fiscal year. So we'll meet with that by the end of fiscal 23. But like I said, we'd love to be able to find a way to keep them because we have a blueprint requirement to increase staffing to change how much time teachers teach. And it's a shame to hire people, train them, and then say, you've got to go. We hope to be able to hire you back in. But you don't have the state budget to support that. we don't have that. the money to do it. But, you know, yeah. yeah. For, is there a course of action? for the budget <laughs> that's before you, we've already spoke at length about these, so I won't. The, this, this budget would add, um, depending on how you want to look at it, either two or 13 positions. Two are the custodians of career and tech. The other 11 are the positions yeah. currently funded by Title I, which can no longer be funded by Title I. So that's not a change in people. It would be a change in positions under the operating budget. And then I'm running out of breath here. And then lastly, uh, we had some discussion about enrollment um, back at the joint meeting a couple of months ago. And we handed out, I think, at that joint meeting in your packet, there were three sheets um, that was the certified state FTE funding number for the, for the current and last two fiscal years. Because at that point, we just wanted to show, or we thought the question might be, how did the pandemic affect your enrollment relative to funding? When the state funds you, they fund on an FTE or full-time equivalent. They back out students. Um, it's an adjusted number. What's, what's before you right here is the actual head count. So this is, you, this, these are the, this isn't an FTE, this isn't adjusted, this is the number of little and big people in our schools from pre-K to 12 in each of these years using September 30, the same date that the state uses as the official count. So, you know, the, the, good, the good news for, for at least me here had been, if you were to dial these numbers back a decade, we peaked in enrollment in 06, 07, fiscal year seven, at, at almost 30,000, like 29 and a few. And then we saw kind of a progressive decline for a decade. And then when we get a, a decade in, so starting around um, fiscal year 17, our enrollment appears to have at least flattened, if not begun to tick up. Uh, even with the pandemic year, we bounced back from that to, to a a pretty appreciable level and, and would have every expectation that we would again we would again see you know a tick up we're probably not going to see hundreds or a thousand students increase like a frederick or, or an Arundel, but we're not in steep decline anymore and that's at least good news from the state level because that should mean our funding shouldn't go down right. from the state <clears throat> and it should go up under the blueprint but it shouldn't go down from the state like it did in the decade prior where we were coming to you're, you, not necessarily the five of you, but the commissioner saying, we've lost $2 million in state revenue. Can you help us make that deficit up before we can even talk about these other things? So the picture on enrollment is better now than it has been, you know, for the for a long time. Mr. O'Neill, yes, has, has there been any forecasting with the census numbers to give us an indication of what our out years will look like? maybe in the next five years? What's the trend? Yeah, so we, we've had, um, there's been changes at the state. I guess I should just leave that there because I don't have the numbers. Um, there's changes at the state in terms of their processes that have made it harder to get some of the data. I want to be careful how I say the that. The data is helpful. We still get the data. We don't get it at the same time in the year when we used to get the data. We get it later in a fiscal year. So we used to produce our enrollments in January, and now we find we can't produce them until later in the spring. And for us, that's, it, it, it'd be helpful to have it sooner, but it still works because ultimately where the Board of Ed's enrollments officially go is, that it's, is in its Educational Facilities Master Plan, which is a document that's approved in June. So we still meet the, we still meet the official timeline, but our projections, which aren't out yet because they'll be in the Master Plan in, um, in June, show us ticking back up in uh, especially in the five-year window it's uh, and I don't want to touch on either a favorite or a terrible topic of, of, of everyone here but it's one of the reasons uh, you know for the board reinstituting its its uh, look at redistricting in the southern area of the county and um, we're 
we're probably close to where we're going to have a status update to the Board of Ed from the work of that committee. But the numbers, and that's not county wide, that's, I mean, that's Region. a primary look at the southern area of the county, but those numbers look, um, look like they're ticking up enough in a five year window mm -hmm. that the status update might be if we really want to balance these enrollments to a certain level, we're probably now into Westminster area. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just to have space to, mm -hmm. to make, you know, to make all of this work. So things look, look, look better than they have looked for a long, long time. And maybe that's why, you know, when you talk about revenues and recordation fees, right. you, maybe some of that turnover are people with families, people with students who are showing up now. Thank you. <clears throat> but as you think about, do you have any questions? I want to thank, um, again, by nature, I've read the budget cover to cover, but um, I don't pretend to be an expert in it. I listened to the four experts that came with me today and the rest of the staff back there. But if you have questions now, great. If not, please feel free to ask them. I know you guys are looking at piles and piles of paperwork and numbers and whatever, but feel free to ask if, if, if there's anything unclear or anything we've glossed over. It's, uh, like I say, these guys are the experts and it's uh, it's easy for you, It's uh, right? But, sure, but Mr. Thanks, Tyler. thanks to those, and I just <laughs> want to encourage you to please before ask. Before you leave, Dr. Lockhart, I want to thank you directly for allowing me to do the tour of the mental health student assets we have in the school system. A special thanks to Administrator McCabe and Mr. Streaker for doing that tour. I was given some data about the uptick. I don't think I'm at liberty to share it, but I just want the public to know that there is a big uptick in the demand that's being placed upon your resources to help our students with their behavioral and mental health issues. And so often, you guys are first contact for these children. And as we get into research and as we find out that there's uh, abuse issues, substance abuse issues, things go much deeper so it is vitally critical that we as a community address the mental health needs of our children in your school and we're seeing an uptick in it because if we don't that'll manifest into a much greater problem for this community and hit our criminal justice system so I appreciate everything you're doing out there thank you when you guys calculate the percentage uh, of income of money that you get from us according to our total budget do you take into account things like the SRO officers and the after school programs, the Boys and Girls Club, all the stuff that we fund? Is that included in your percentage? So, like in kind services? What are you referring well, to? Well, like right here on your, in your paper, it says the Board of Education pres presently receives 43.2% of the county budget, which is down from an average of 47%. On that 42%, or 43.2% do you consider the SROs the in-kind stuff the after-school programs because no, that's a good chunk of money that we're putting into that as well that's ongoing revenue to the full board of it okay yeah. but so that's but what I'm, my point is we put much more money than that into the school system sure and that's not Absolutely. reflected in that percentage okay right. thank you but it was reflected when it was 47 percent um, SROs were not reflected then Well, the SRO, for some of those years, yeah. it was. You pay for the SROs? No, 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 no. What he's saying is when it's the higher percentage, it also doesn't reflect the SROs right. at all. Right, that's exactly what I said. Right. Right. The percentage I'm with you on that. Right. 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure yeah. it's yeah. worth debating the details of this. No, We've I'm been just, through this many, many times. Right. This is not a useful number. You know, I, I went back decades to look at how much, what portion of our budget is, is your budget, and it, it's varied from under 45 percent 50 50 percent not in any pattern it's changed over time and it totally ignores that every time the commissioners are given a new expenditure the only way the school system can say the same percentage of our budget is if something else goes away uh it it, right. it, it just it's not useful right. I, I don't i don't know why we continue to focus on this really. to focus on percentage right. yeah right. i i agree yeah, and, and that's probably to, me more than the experts. No, no, it's all good. As, as opposed to we just understand talking that. numbers, actual numbers, <laughs> right. helps. And I, I, right. right. So yeah, I think we're all in agreement. I think um, if you can, that that slide deck was very valuable. Um, if you can add whatever notes you want to on that slide deck from the discussion you had this morning, um, can also help us 
uh, or help at least me capture, you know, okay. uh, the information. You know, it, it was a lot of information, so there may be certain highlights you have from your notes that you want to put into the slide deck for us. Um, and then all we have to do is print off the slide with notes type of thing. Um, at least that would help me. Uh, I okay. notice you have your new budget person with you. Who is he? Uh, um, any, uh, well, we finally got rid of some. No, I'm kidding. Uh, any I'm other good. discussion points, comments? No, there will probably Thank be you. some questions coming yeah. down the pike, but yeah. Yeah. hang on because we just, it's the first we've seen Get it started. Okay. And as Mr. Kyler uh, said earlier, we recognize uh, the myriad of priorities. Yeah. Um, and resources being requested of you. We thank you for your consideration today, opportunity to have some discussion, um, and and appreciate your support. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Good dialogue. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. It's very informative. Okay. Let's move on to uh, access, Carol. <coughs> going to talk about the ongoing operational costs with increased expenses, especially since COVID-19. They are complicated by significant salary demands, staff retention, supply costs, and limited access to routine fundraising efforts. Talk Good to morning. Us. Good morning. You read that well. Uh, thank you for um, letting me come and, and present today. So, um, as you know, Access Carroll is incredibly grateful for the partnership with the Carroll County government, and there's been a lot of amazing um, first things that have happened in Carroll County because of the, the, that partnership. Um, we just really felt that it was important that we start looking at the budget, not only for FY23, but ongoing um, beyond the $20,000 flat funding that we've had now for, um, for, for 10 years. I've been more than 10 years actually so there's just been uh, COVID-19 uh, you probably I'm tired of hearing about it. I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it but it really truly has changed the dynamic in a lot of aspects especially I, I, I'll say the most amazing impact has been with staff retention staff attraction um, just getting good qualified people to stay in their jobs for more than three to six months and um, that's just the bare facts. Um, the cost of supplies in healthcare has not gone down, it's actually gone up. Um, and I can't give you an exact percentage in terms of where we're at, because it's been a moving target over the last two years. There was some, some supply and demand issues. Um, and we've been able to get some supplies and cushions from the health department, which has been a, a benefit. But beyond that, those supplies are kind of you know, finished. We're moving into the new normal, the new normal um, we're looking at just increasing costs. Although the, the county financial cash contribution is very small in our $2.5 million overall budget, it matters. And one of the things that I'm gonna say is that I'm constantly being asked by potential financial contributors and stakeholders, particularly private foundations, is what is your own community doing to support your, your operations? Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm always going out there trying to get other funding and other support um, we got considerable support from other major stakeholders. It's just that all of it adds up into one um, kind of uh, <coughs> diverse, uh, diversified funding um, revenue pool. And it also helps with leveraging, leveraging those dollars. So um, there's nothing really like fancy that I, uh, that I can share um, beyond the <coughs> basics. I'm happy to answer any questions. The uh, breakdown of the 30,000 request mm -hmm. is it shows primarily psychiatric and um, uh, behavioral health. Behavioral health, yeah. That's been, that's been the greatest challenge. And I think that 
we as a community are doing a good job overall looking at not only the assessment and need of behavioral health care, but how we're able to address it from different service providers, whether it's an acute care setting or to like an access carol, who are doing basic assessments, walk-in services, and then um, outpatient ambulatory care. So the cost of providers, um, the demands have increased more than 25% over the last two years to retain the same staff that we had, and no one's salaries in the other service areas have gone up at that, at that extreme. There's just been a lot of interesting um, trends that we're seeing. I'm not the only one feeling it. I'm in consortiums multiple times a month. Everybody's saying the same thing. So everybody's feeling it. Um, you know, that, that where did the number 30,000 come from? Um, it's basically, again, a part of a bigger fu funding where we're looking at, well, how can we maybe use that, that funding to go directly into staff? And that is staffing, by the way. It's, it's money going right into staff positions. A lot of the things that Access Carol does are not re reimbursable through insurance or through other areas of, of, of traditional private practice revenue. So we're looking at subsidy. We're looking at how can we make sure we're providing that care regardless of the patient's ability to pay at time of visit. We do offer a very conservative sliding fee scale for our county residents as well. And we're making sure that we're able to get those folks into services um, at, at any income level. And income level shouldn't always matter, right? But it, but it, but it does. So we, we look at those things. We make sure that we're being fiduciarily responsible um, to, those, to those clients' obligations as well. Um, so free care is free care, but we're trying to be responsible with giving people services right. that might be addressed later. Celine, you're here for moral support, or did you want to add? No, I'm, I am just here with Tammy as um, uh, the, the agency that works with our allied agencies and, and Tammy being one of them uh, with the county. And, um, and just as you all know, Tammy is my my co-chair for the Circle of Caring Continuous mm -hmm. Home, can, Circle of Caring can, um, Homelessness Board, and I, I think that it's very important the work that Access Carol does uh, with all of our at-risk individuals. I mean, you're all very well aware of the services that they provide, and, and it's very important in our community to have have that support. And it, and as as Tammy <coughs> noted, you know, when when we have somebody that needs an assess a mental health assessment, um, substance use assessment, when we need to get them into services. Um, uh, Access Carol is one of those agencies that can help to do that immediately. Um, it, it's very rare, if ever, that I call Tammy and she says, we can't, we can't help you. It's always a yes, and, and how can we do it? Tammy, do you have um, uh, LifeBridge or hospital staff co-located? We do. So I'm one of those staff, and I have two others. Actually, another team member who's new to our team, Trudy, is here um, for business operations. And then I have a care coordinator, nurse navigator. Um, so there's three of us that are complete gifts from LifeBridge um, to the community through Access Carol service. Um, plus, Carol uh, and LifeBridge provide significant cash support right. for operations as well, contributing to that $2.5 million cash budget. And and um, I would expect LifeBridge will continue that as yes, well. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, they're very committed to the the health of our community. Yeah. Um, and we're always evaluating where is the greatest need and how can we make the biggest impact stretching the dollar as far as possible um, and I, I'm happy to ever provide a, a drill down on any mm -hmm. of that yeah. um, metric. We stretch the dollar far more than your typical private practice would. We also have a significant attraction for professional volunteers. We had 121 professional volunteers despite COVID this past year. Mm -hmm. We never shut our doors during COVID ever. We provided virtual care but we yep. provided on-site yep. care. Um, so there's still that dynamic um, that's very attractive for Carroll County. We're starting to get the, the, the request for tours again. And um, before COVID, I was giving tours multiple times right. a month to outside entities wanting to learn more about how does Carroll County do this. Right. So we're, we're back to, to, um, to those schedules and um, there's always good things happening. I'm always looking to expand as well because I see the need. Where can we make it work? Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, we're... Just last comment about, again, we're, I feel we're very fortunate, blessed in so many ways to have the medical systems we have here in Maryland, from yeah. Shock Trauma University of Maryland medical system to LifeBridge uh, here in Carroll County. Mm -hmm. um, they are committed 
uh, all of them, Johns Hopkins, to services like this. And, and LifeBridge um, is extremely accessible um, from their leadership on down so, for your needs. So that, that's good. I, want to, I just wanted to hear that from you. Go ahead. I just want to say thanks for all the work that you do here because you're a last resort for many people have nowhere else to turn, but they need some help. And when people ask ask me, I send send you a lot of people. By the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> they ask me. That's I say, good. You I said, have you called Access, did. Carol? Yeah. Because they can help you yeah. out. And I really do appreciate everything that you do for the community. Thank you. Thank you. You, for you don't know how many times over the years I've used you as an example. Twenty thousand dollars flat funding, and you turn it into two and a half million dollar year after year after yeah. year. That that's not unheard of most places. And. Yeah. So oh. if we give it the other 30,000, it's going to be like 10.7. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, but thank, thank you what you've done to the people in Carroll County. Okay. Well, it's always an honor to serve, and I think what's more amazing about this whole thing is that we're just a community that talks. We coordinate. We collaborate. Um, yeah. We have a good spirit of, of serving our, the people that we live with. So. And you got a great partner in crime with Celine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, mental health issues affect us all, not just the students, which I emphasized earlier, but you also help service our veterans in the community as well. Yes. So yes, thank sir. you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yep. Thank you. Always thank, reach thanks. out. Always come by. We're open seven days a week. Okay. Let's move on to animal control. A specific issue, animal control officer position. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I emailed uh, Chris Swam a PowerPoint. Nope, that's okay. I no, no, we'll, we'll find out. Chris, <laughs> do you have uh, the PowerPoint deck? Can he hear it from here? If he's awake, yeah. I don't know. You never know. No <laughs> voice from above. Hey, if, Matt. If wanna, not, I okay. have it printed. <laughs> Just Okay. There you go. There you go. All right. Thanks. Good morning, commissioners. I'm here with Chief uh, Animal Control Officer Mark Miller to present the need for an additional officer position for animal control. In 1990 or 1977, the Carroll County Commissioners contracted the Humane Society of Carroll County to perform all duties pertaining to the control of domestic animals, including enforcing laws, selling dog licenses, dog licenses, and sheltering animals. Since then, the theory of animal control has changed dramatically. We are no longer the dog catchers as once seen in Lady and the Tramp, but now protectors and savers of animals. The Humane Society of Carroll County has stepped up to be a more progressive animal welfare agency raising our live release rate and qualifying as no kill since 2015. Our officers are receiving more support and training to enforce animal neglect and cruelty laws, triage injured animals in the field to be transported to area veterinarians instead of being euthanized. And they are educating the public about responsible animal care as a result, our relationship with the community and public image have improved along with the morale of our employees. A 1997 study conducted by the National Animal Control Association found the average ratio of field animal control officers to citizens was one officer to 16 to 18,000 persons. Even compared to this very outdated study, Carroll County Animal Control is grossly understaffed. We have one officer for every 42,000 <coughs> citizens. Our chief officer is included in the four officers as he must respond to calls to help manage the call load. This significantly impairs his ability to oversee our department. We currently have the county uh, separated into four sections. Each officer is responsible for a section. Our chief officer handles Hampstead, Manchester, Lineborough, Millers, and Westminster. Our senior officer handles 
Mount Airy, Woodbine, Sykesville, and uh, Finksburg, while another officer handles Westminster, New Windsor, Union Bridge, and Taylorsville. And our newest officer handles Tawnytown, Keymar, Detour, Harney, and Westminster. Oftentimes, um, personnel are unavailable due to court, training, PTO, or injuries and illness. In those cases, officers need to care, cover those areas. Uh, as we present to you today, our county is covered by two officers because Chief Miller is here and we have an officer that's recovering from surgery. So if somebody's handling a call in Miller's mm -hmm. and a call comes in uh, up in you know Union Bridge, they are going to have to have that travel time all the way across the county. And if we're dealing with a rabid animal or an aggressive animal, public safety is at risk. So our normal non-emergency response hours, we handle emergencies during that time also, but each officer works 40 hours per week responding to calls for service. Then we also handle after hours emergencies and each officer is on call one weeknight a week. So Monday through Thursday and then weekends, Friday through Sunday are rotated every fourth week. Um, when an ACO is on leave or training or sick, emergency response must be covered requiring additional shifts. This past year, we had two ACOs at the same time out on short-term disability due to surgeries that were unpreventable. During that time, the, that on-call and the normal work week was covered by two officers only. Um, during that time, uh, on one evening, we had a request to assist the Sheriff's Department. Both officers were required. That call came in approximately 11 o'clock. They were on scene from midnight until approximately 9 a.m. the next morning, at which time they then responded to calls until 4.30 to the county. Uh, and then one of those officers who had been up for 24 hours then was on call for that evening. At one time, Carroll County's animal control program was merely a trucking operation that picked up stray and unwanted animals. It is now a viable program of animal control and rescue that contributes to the education of the community and helps win public support for and compliance with the animal care and control ordinances. Animal control cases are extremely labor intensive often dealing with large and dangerous animals. Animals are documented as evidence and transported for care to our shelter. In cases that animals do not meet the legal requirements for seizure, our officers monitor properties to ensure minimum standards are maintained and owners have complied with veterinarians' orders. In 2021, we had multiple large cases taking days upon days of investigation and follow through and monitoring. On one of these cases, 26 dogs were removed from a property. On another case, seven dogs were removed. There was a case where 17 horses were seized, multiple were had to be euthanized, and then we continue today to monitor the remaining horses on the property. Um, that number is approximately 75, it may be less now, but we are still maintain, we're still monitoring that property. In another case, we removed 24 cows, 12 pigs, and six dogs. That was a multi-day operation, and the cattle needed days and days of veterinary care where the vet had to come in every week or two weeks to treat the animals, at which point our officers had to help run them through squeeze pens so that they could be treated and documented all of the vet care that took place. Oftentimes, that occurred on Saturdays. And then in another case, we removed 100 animals in one evening from a barn. Each of those biting, scratching rabbits had to be photographed, documented, and uh, marked as evidence. 
that these are extremely labor intensive and they take every officer in the county, myself and the chief, to be there to handle that and to transport. Um, so the, as I said, the, these cases require extensive investigation, documentation, veterinarian visits, and time in court. Often animals in these situations are unsocialized and aggressive. The conditions are frequently hazardous, making the removal process time consuming and physically and mentally taxing on our ACOs. Animal Control has operated with three ACOs and one chief ACO for the past 40 years despite a population increase of 445%. Each Carroll officer serves an additional 10,000 citizens as compared to Frederick County. The American Veterinary Medical Association U.S. Pet Ownership Statistics estimate that 34,430 Carroll County households also own pets. And keep in mind, we also handle sick um, and injured wildlife. Using the National Animal Care and Control Association's field staffing recommendations, Carroll County should have six to seven animal control officers. As Carroll County's population increases and expands into once considered rural areas, the workload of ACOs increases and changes. Animal call requests are generated by citizens. I'm sorry. <laughs> Animal call requests are generated by citizens' requests for services. Carroll County Animal Control does not have the resources to get, engage in unassigned patrols or proactive patrolling. ACOs move from one call to the next with no time to take care of general housekeeping activities. Many requests for services involve activities that citizens complete previously handled themselves and do not report. So by the time we get there, they're already angry. Barking dog calls, animal neglect investigations, and, call, and calls involving human interaction with wildlife become more frequent and time consuming as citizens continue to move to once rural areas. The challenges presented affect officer and public safety. Our ACOs are suffering from burnout, injuries, and compassion fatigue. Attempting to write a report and log evidence for a large case while still receiving calls for service to address barking, dogs at large, and wildlife calls lead to decreased response time and poor customer service. Nuisance calls are low priority and can take days to address. The Humane Society of Carroll County Animal Control has made great strides in the past seven years from our no-kill status to our consistent enforcement of state and county laws. Our growth has been clear to the community and we have now become a trusted guardian of our county's unwanted and abused animals. We have only operated our current level because our staff's passion for HSCC's mission and dedication to saving animals. All of this has been accomplished without a additional compensation in our budget or additional staffing in order for Carroll County Animal Control to continue to serve the community and protect animals effectively and safely we must have additional staff so you may have questions <laughs> okay thank you very much um, any questions the one-time cost what, what's included in the one-time cost uh, our budget analyst has that, Heidi. Um, the salary is usually starting. Well, I see the ongoing okay. cost, but one-time well, cost. But the biggest part would be the vehicle. The vehicle, okay. and especially right now, the vehicles are difficult. Okay. We're struggling with that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You don't have any spare vehicles out there, do you? We we have a backup vehicle. It is a unmarked pickup truck that is uh, used for inclement weather or when okay. one of the vehicles is in maintenance. Those so you, types okay. of things. Um, it's say, it's not set up yeah. with all of the caging. Right. Okay. I was going to say it's a Pinto, but <laughs> <laughs> um, all the work you do is amazing. Uh, obviously, and I think that. You're going to get the appreciation from all of us saying <laughs> that. Um, 
you know, the only, well, the only question I think I have is, is there cross-training done uh, within the Sheriff's Department and you? So the Sheriff's Department deputies have a certain level of skills to when they come upon an animal? So we, we do uh, work with the Sheriff's Department quite a bit. If animals are aggressive and, mm -hmm. and say EMS is responding and they can't get in the house because of a dog, they do normally call us um, because they don't want to take lethal measures against somebody's pet that's just protecting their owner. So we do come in. We um, have provided many of the police departments with our restraint poles, which is the safe way of being able to loop a dog and keep it away from you. Um, so we do, we do, they all also will go in if we have a deer that has been hit by a car and is mm -hmm. suffering, they will dispatch that deer for us if we can't get there. Um, so we try to work with them as much as possible and they call us in uh, vice versa. So if sure. they have a, a cruelty or domestic that involves an animal, then, then they'll call us yeah. in. I, I'm just thinking a, a train the trainer type of program that can be designed for those that are going to be, you know, um, in proximity of animals, uh, like the sheriffs or the different municipalities, uh, you know, police. So, okay. I must say, it's a shame to see that the uptick in neglect and cruelty calls have gone up in the last two years because in my mind, I'm thinking that the pets are the one comfort that a lot of people <laughs> have had over the last two years, and I thought it would be the opposite. Is there any indication of what, what's going on and why? Well, I think when you see a rise in, in, in crime just across the board, animal neglect is follows that trend. But also, um, when we're dealing with domestic abuse, oftentimes animal, well, most of the time, animals, if they are in the household, are used against the, the person who is uh, the victim. Sorry to hear that. So, um, and, you know, we always start, as we're watching what's kind of going on in the world with inflation, inflation and everything else, when people can't afford their animals, can't afford vet care, can't afford food, and as much as we try to help with that, animals get neglected because unfortunately, especially people with livestock and things, if they can't afford hay, they don't want to get rid of those animals and they'll try and kind of limp it along and that's when we see, see emaciated animals and because they're not getting the proper care. Yeah, what a shame. Let's hope those numbers come down. <laughs> We'd like to work our way out of the job. <laughs> <laughs> Good way of saying. Uh, that's always our goal. Any other comments, discussion? Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Commissioner. <clears throat> thank you. Okay. Carroll County Youth Service Bureau. Looking for operating costs. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing well. Ready for warmer weather. Bob. Yeah, aren't we it's all? It's just me. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not just you. We want right back into winter. <laughs> Celine, did you want to sit up here for moral yeah. support? I, I fear Celine's you would. Celine's going to join me moral support. So, um, good morning. Um, for the record, Lynn Davis with Carroll County Youth Service Bureau. And um, I'm here today um, respectfully requesting the sum of $50,256 for a new phone system for Carroll County Youth Service Bureau. Um, our phone system was put in about 2009 when we entered our new facility. And um, uh, just to talk a little bit about the importance of it, certainly you all know this, but um, but our phone system is used to take referrals from new clients, to schedule psychiatric and counseling appointments, um, to respond to our, um, our current clients who are in crisis, um, also to communicate with uh, many of our partners, in, in uh, attorneys, Carroll Hospital Center, et cetera. Um, and, um, just that it was a critical uh, part of our communication, certainly during COVID. Um, 
we had <coughs> clients who did not have technology to be able to, uh, to, to use that kind of audiovisual, so we relied on phone systems for, for many of them. Our phone system is dropping words, and um, it's just really going been going downhill for about a year now. But when you when you dial out, Lynn, does it spin when you dial? Out? <laughs> no, but my back. brother had one of those rotary phones for a long time. <laughs> they requested it back from him. I teased him and said they wanted to put it in a museum. So, but it's anyway, um, not quite yeah. that bad, but. Not so good. In fact, Celine called me one time with someone who had tried to reach us, and we we looked at everything and couldn't figure out what it was. And you know, it then it really worried us that we could have lost a call. Um, and certainly, this was an agency that might call back again. But what if it was a client who that was that was their one shot kind of thing? So, um, so um, it's certainly critical. Um, it's really a critical tool in effectively providing our services. So um, just wanted to let you know, I mentioned this to Celine um, before even considering one-time funding, is that we were gonna look for other grants that might provide the funds to, um, to help us with this. But we were unsuccessful in finding grants that will pay for this kind of technology. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so just to let you know, we, we did our due diligence uh, with that first, and then we used our IT manager and Kite Tech, who currently provides our internet services, to research different kind of options for us. Um, and you'll see, oh, let's see, I'm going to go back. Is this, I don't think this is the first one, first slide, but maybe it is. Um, should I do backspace? Yeah, okay, so, yeah, let me start with you. So our new phone system, it's based on Microsoft Teams. Um, we have Microsoft Teams as our internet, 365, Microsoft 365. Um, it was developed after, like I said, an evaluation process. Um, we don't have the time for installation right now, but we, we know that it's critical. Um, it will involve some staff training, which we will hear some grumblings and grouching <laughs> with that. Um, the present legacy system, um, it just needed an update. So, and I mentioned the platform's already there. Um, compared to the comp competition, it's really cost effective, and I will show you an example of that. Um, we are gonna learn some new functions in addition to just a phone system with this. Um, so the ways to use this phone system, um, you can cross the one on the left out because it was just so expensive to consider new um, handsets. So this is gonna be a learning curve for all of us, but we're gonna be using headsets and then we're also, uh, it will also connect to our mobile phones. Um, I'm probably one of the ones that will be grumbling about that. I like that phone in my head, but um, it just was such an incredible different cost-wise. So this is what it's gonna look like. Um, it'll be on our screen and we'll use the cursor to dial people. We'll have favorites on there, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's gonna be new and different um, and we're going to embrace it. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, Kite Tech will coordinate all the installation for this. Um, like I said, we're going to learn some other things while we're at it, um, but there will be lots of um, video learning. So, um, you know, I mean, it, when I say that, it's not going to be long and arduous process, but we're just going to have to learn some of those skills. Um, Okay. So um, initially, we're going to emphasize the Teams. Um, we have a Teams platform in place. Um, a lot of people, we can't get them off Zoom, but we're working on that to get them into the, the Teams portal. Um, and like I said, we're going to have the opportunity for additional trainings as well, which will be um, great. So here are the phone cost comparisons um, that, that we have. Um, the one that we chose, of course, is the one in green. Um, it's the lowest cost um, and the biggest change, as I mentioned, but I think that we're all going to, you know, be fine to, to go with this. So, um, buying all new headsets for 80 people, 85 people with our interns is, was just cost prohibitive. So, so this is really the way that, um, that we decided to go. And, um, 
You know, and it was hard saying, you know, consequences if not funded. I mean, obviously, if, if you all aren't able to do this, we are going to, we have to do it. It's just not good um, business practice not to have working phone systems, so. Does so this include your new building, too? I wish. <laughs> um, it will it will be transferred into the new building so again we won't have handsets or any of that right. so it's going to be a cost savings um, really when we looked at it after this three-year initial phase it's going to be less costly to us than what we're paying right now so it's I think a moving uh, in the right direction so yeah. so when you go down through here Lynn Mm -hmm. Quantum had a monthly cost for service and a monthly lease. Mm -hmm. Th that was the monthly leases for the equipment. Okay, the global <coughs> was included. So Microsoft Teams, you have NA beside that. What? It, it, so it, the eight ninety six is yes. is that monthly? Uh, that that is monthly. Um, that. And that includes both the cost for service and the lease? Yes, both together. Okay. Yeah. And part of it's because we already have the system in place. So. Okay. Yeah. Is that licensing? What? Oh, the software, I'm sure, is licensed. Yeah, yeah. 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 but I Microsoft. guess it's all included. Yeah, but in the you price. already have Microsoft 365, and Teams is embedded in Microsoft 365. It is, but the phone system is not. Okay. So, yes. and then if you okay. look at the um, at the, the bottom, there's yeah, a Microsoft Teams with right. direct routing. Right. That's even more expensive. Yeah. So okay. we really went yeah. with the lowest okay. cost, but we really feel like, um, and our our IT manager and also Kite Tech, who's going to yeah. do the work for us. I mean, they didn't try yeah. to sell us something bigger. They said, okay. "I think this will really work for your agency." So. Okay. I mean, I I'm I'm a Microsoft Teams user. I mean. <sighs> on a, every almost every day uh, in multiple calls it's a good system uh, just let you know new computers uh, noise cancellation becomes difficult so you have to set it up well because uh, it's it's different than zoom different than go to meeting there I mean each one has their own benefits and quirks associated they so, do. Yeah. but uh, no it's it's very intuitive uh, the teams um, so, okay, uh, any additional question? I think pretty no. self-explanatory. No. no? Okay, thank you. No. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much for okay, listening. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, Historical Society of Carroll County urging repairs to the Kimmy House to ensure archi archival materials, books, and objects are protected. And Morning, Commissioner. Library safely accessible and welcoming to the public. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Morning. I see you brought the big guns with you, Miss Wheeler. <laughs> yes, sir. Good morning, Commissioners. Nice to be with you this One morning. One of the county artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Must be preserved. <laughs> so all you got to do, Lynn, is move. Don't stand underneath the leak, and you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, I've met I some. wish I could say I'm shrinking. <laughs> uh, my name is Jason Alari. I'm the new executive director of the Historical Society. It's nice to be with you this morning. I'm here, of course, with Lynn and Jim Shriver is here with us, board member. Doug Velinoski is on our board, is in the room. Okay. And also Frank Badovic serves on our board of trustees. Uh, we wanted to convey to the commissioners and to the county how appreciative we are of the county's support year after year. I think uh, we're all in agreement that without your support, we could not fulfill our mission the way that we do. We have five slides. We're going to keep it brief. It's related to Kimmy House. Lynn, I don't know if you make that full screen. There we go. Okay. Our request pertains to the Kimmy House, 210 East Main Street. I think you're familiar with the location, society headquarters. It houses our administrative offices and some of our most significant collections uh, in stewardship at the Historical Society. If you look at this photograph, the collections are on the second floor and that uh, half-story third floor. We also have our research library. 
uh, on the first floor on the left hand side of the slide on the first floor. This image shows the entrance to the Kimmy Library. And we assist about 5,000 patrons at Kimmy every year. And most of those folks are visiting the library. They're doing genealogical research and look, doing uh, chain title research for properties. They're looking at maps. They're looking at research books. Uh, this other image shows one of our volunteers working with our newspaper collections. We hold in the public trust about 40,000 objects, uh, rel all related to Carroll County history. And these are things like uh, fine, fine art, manuscripts, rare books, uh, small objects, textiles. If you can name it related to Carroll County, we have it in our collections. Here's a little show and tell, a little sampling. On the left, you see a quilt sewn by Margaret Bucky of Carroll County from 1837, 57, excuse me. It's in wonderful condition. I hope you, know, you have it in color. Above the eagle is a little inscription that says E Pluribus Unum, and uh, it's very patriotic. The medal that you see in the middle was given posthumously to Charles Smith of Smallwood for his role in the Spanish-American War, Sergeant Charles Smith. We have that at Kimmy as well. And then I think we all know John Longwell, considered one of the founding fathers of Carroll County, Westminster, 19th century portrait. And this is an oil on canvas that is also at Kimmy. We, we were just saying that Commissioner Weaver presented that medal to <laughs> Sergeant Smith of Smallwood <laughs> at the time. So That's great. Good for just, you, Dick. He, we'll he put him in that museum. He looks very good you, for his age. Weren't you in the Navy? <laughs> Way to go. Way to go, Dickie. <laughs> So it's just a sample. The next slide shows, uh, we get down to the request for Kimmy. The photographs on the left um, are pertaining to an HVAC unit uh, that services that second and, and half story third floor Kimmy. We, this HVAC unit has been failing for years. Repeated service calls coming out. Um, we've had technicians tell us, you need to replace this unit. The images that you're seeing there is damage done from when that unit failed a while back. We had water pool on the ceiling on the second floor, came down onto the textile collections, mostly 19th century quilts. They had to be sent out to uh, Virginia for conservation. They're back in our hands now, uh, luckily. So this is just a sample of some of, of the damage that was done. And then the, the second prong of our, uh, of our ask is fixing roof leaks uh, above the library at Kimmy. We have two active leaks, one at the rear side of the library. The image on the right shows some of the ceiling falling down on the, on the back side of the library, and also some water staining in that image to the left from the other leak on the front side of the library. We need to, we need to fix these issues uh, to ensure that the collections are cared for, to ensure that we have um, the society remains accessible uh, for patrons coming in to see the collections, to utilize the library. And we don't want to kick this can anymore. I, th I think it, I believe that it's uh, vital that we accomplish these tasks. And I think it's going to position us well in the coming months to um, ensure that the collections on the second and third floors, also in the library, are protected. And we really appreciate you looking at this and considering it. And if Jim, you'd like to offer anything, or, or Lynn, um, in well, addition? Well, I'd just like to say that we are delighted that Jason has joined us. He, he joined the staff. Uh, he comes with a lot of experience, including a uh, master's in museum work, and we feel that he's going to be a superb partner in helping us to maintain and make accessible our collection. Um, as with any historical society, we have fabulous volunteers who have committed immense time and effort to trying to tell the story of Carroll County, such as Bill Palm, who's been the volunteer librarian there for uh, 11 years, and Mimi, who needs no introduction. And, you know, people that are very committed to telling the story, and uh, so uh, we appreciate very, very much the kind of partnership that you give to the community so that we can do this work. And we would like to be able, of course, with it, uh, it's hard enough to keep a 25-year-old house in good shape, but a 200-plus-year-old house gives us great challenge, and we want to be able to maintain it so that the work and the artifacts can be saved. So 
thank you. And of course, Jim needs no introduction well, I'm to you. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity for the Historical Society to appear before the commissioners. Uh, as you can see, what Jason highlighted, these are uh, repairs that are urgent, and the projects are identified and clearly uh, are in need. Uh, as you know, water damage uh, only makes uh, uh, worse over time, and uh, those primary sources in that library are unique to Carroll County. Uh, people come to research there because you have primary sources that you can't find anywhere else. And in the collection, many of those items are donated, and the citizens of Carroll County have proudly entrusted those uh, uh, textiles, documents, manuscripts, portraits uh, to the Historical Society, and we hope to maintain them in good condition because they're meaningful to our history and uh, how people connect to Carroll County. And it brings people back to look at the uh, collection, to use the library, and I think it's a great public service to the citizens of Carroll County to have that unique history available to them. Yeah, very well said. And uh, I saw the Francis Scott Key newspaper, I think Commissioner Wance was reading that when it first was published, but <laughs> now it's going this way. It was going that <laughs> way. I'm just saying. Um, okay, but uh, yeah. Did so we put an extra twenty grand in your budget last year. Did you, you use that for repairs? Yes, I would we did. assume, right? Yes. There were some things. I, and, I knew and there was there were some sidewalk issues. Lynn, remember or something? Yeah. Uh, and also, Commissioner Lance, um, we have a grant from the state we're delighted to have to fix the brickwork at Kimmy and okay, uh, so we're you know working on finishing up that match and you know there's been a lot of effort put in on the part of volunteers for example yeah. the past president Chris McMaster's paid to have all the the doors and windows painted I mean we're trying right. to do what we can and we're very thankful yeah. for all yeah. of the support you give us okay. we realize yeah. that um, you've got a lot of very worthy things on your plate, and we appreciate do, do your we partnership also, we with purchased, uh, you. You purchased, you received a, a plotter, right? Yes. Was that a very large printer plotter? We did. Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yep. Director Ilari, did I get it right? Ilari. All right. Welcome aboard. Thank you. I think that history is one of those nerdy subjects that not everyone pays attention to. A lot of people are like, why we waste all this time? I think Miss Wheeler nailed it when she said, this is our story. Mm -hmm. Carroll County is very really unique. And I'm honored that you guys take the time to preserve all this and value our history. Thank you. Okay, Thank you very else? much. No, I, no, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Gentlemen, there for moral support in the back. Thank you, <laughs> no, Thank you for your consideration. You. Absolutely. You guys have a thankless job. And you brought a lot of support with you. No, I, We're glad you could have some humor and on each other. While we <laughs> I haven't forgotten you, Jim. Catch up. Okay. okay. All right. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. We are going to uh, recess at this time, reconvene at uh, 1301 p.m. Um, with uh, library and then DPW. So I need a anything administratively. Ted, anything? Motion <coughs> to recess till one o'clock. Second. Uh, motion second. Any discussion? Seen here. None. All in favor? Aye. Aye.